In this video, we're going to start by covering substitutions and eliminations of amines. Thus far in this chapter, I've taught you guys how to do various substitution reactions involving alcohols, ethers, and epoxides. Question is, can we do substitution reactions with amines? Well, unfortunately, the answer is no. You can't do substitution reactions to amines, and the reason is because amines, which have this generic structure here, are poor leaving groups. That is, if I ever attempted to do this, having a hydroxide nucleophile, for instance, come in and form a bond with a carbon and kick off an NH2 minus, that just wouldn't happen. And the reason is because an NH2 minus is too unstable. Thus, we can say, this won't happen. So is there anything I can do with an amine? Well, you might suggest something like this. What if I protonated the amine? If I could protonate this amine and then react it with a nucleophile, in theory, you could have the nucleophile attack this carbon, form a bond with it, and kick off an NH3. And an NH3 would be neutral, so you'd think that would be a good leaving group, right? Does this work? As it turns out, it does not. What ends up happening if you have a protonated amine and you treat it with a base like hydroxide is the base just steals the extra proton off of the amine to form water and give me back my neutral amine. So once again, it begs the question, is there anything that amines can do that's useful? Well, the answer is yes. You can do substitution reactions where the amines are the nucleophiles. For instance, if I take a very simple amine like this molecule and treat it with an alkyl halide, such as this alkyl bromide, the lone pairs on the nitrogen will come over, form a bond with this carbon, and kick off the bromide to give me this type of intermediate. Now, I realize that nitrogen has a positive charge, and I assume that you probably know that it's not because the nitrogen lacks a full octet. It's just because it has four bonds around it, where nitrogen likes to have only three bonds to be neutral. These types of molecules, despite the fact they might look unstable on paper, are in fact fairly stable. They are called quaternary ammonium salts. This bromide anion acts as a counter ion to help balance out the partial positive charge of this ammonium salt. Ammonium salts are actually useful because we can do E2 reactions on them to form alkenes. Here's an example. I've got an ammonium salt that has the nitrogen bonded to four different carbon groups. The counter ion is a hydroxide. If I heat this up, the hydroxide will grab a proton off of this carbon, pump the electrons down here to form a carbon-carbon double bond at this point, and then pump these two electrons into the nitrogen to neutralize its charge, forming an alkene. Thus, this is an additional way to make alkenes, by going through a quaternary ammonium salt. One detail that I want to point out is that amine eliminations violate Zaitsev's rule. If you want to see more details on this, you can consult pages 436 to 437 of our text, or just look at the example I'm going to show you on the next slide. Draw the product of the following reaction. You'll note that I've got a quaternary ammonium salt and a hydroxide counter ion. I heat this thing up, and what type of product will it give me? Well, of course, you'll note that this hydroxide is going to reach over and grab a hydrogen from the carbon adjacent to one of the carbons bonded to the nitrogen. Pump these electrons down there to form a double bond and pump these electrons into the nitrogen to neutralize its charge, thereby forming this neutral amine and this alkene. Now, you might look at this and ask, couldn't the hydroxide grab a proton off of this carbon? pump the electrons down here, and then push these two electrons into the nitrogen, giving me a double bond between these two carbons here, that would be a more substituted alkene, and would seemingly, therefore, be a more stable alkene by Zaitsev's rule. Well, the short answer is yes, that could happen. However, it doesn't, for reasons that are discussed on pages 436 and 437 of our text, which I won't share here. The take-home point is this. When we have a quaternary ammonium salt and we do an elimination on it, it favors formation of the alkene that is less substituted, which I like to call the anti of alkene product. We now move on to an additional subject, substitutions with thiols and sulfides. This molecule right here, that is, if this sulfur was attached to a hydrogen instead of it having a negative charge, would be called a thiol. 
When I remove that hydrogen with a base and replace it with a negative charge, this charged sulfur compound called a thiolate can act as a nucleophile to attack a carbon on an alkyl halide and kick off the halogen itself. That forms this type of molecule in which the sulfur is bonded to two alkyl groups, which is called a sulfide. Similarly, you can take a sulfide and treat it with an additional alkyl halide to form this type of product called a trimethyl sulfonium iodide. As with our quaternary ammonium salts, sulfur can handle a positive charge, not because it lacks a full octet, but because it's forming more bonds than it likes to in a neutral state. So these are substitution reactions with thiols and sulfides. In the next slides, I'm going to summarize all of the reactions we've learned in chapter 10. For students who are taking this class from me, I will post a PDF copy of all my reaction list online for you to access, free of charge. Well, you know, except for the exorbitant amount of money that we charge you to take the class in the first place. But it's okay. It justifies my salary. If you take an alcohol and react it with HX, it replaces the OH with an X, where X is equal to chlorine, bromine, or iodine. Similarly, if you take an ether and treat it under the same conditions, it will form RX and an alcohol. The X could bond to the R group on the left or the right, depending on the individual mechanism. So be careful when you're looking at a specific example. Separately, if I treat an alcohol with SOCL2 or phosphorus trichloride, I will replace the OH with a chlorine. If I treat an alcohol with PBr3, I can replace the OH with a bromine. If I treat an alcohol with tosyl chloride, mesyl chloride, or triflyl chloride and pyridine, which I forgot to write here, I will convert the ROH into an ROTS, an ROMS, or an ROTF. Why in the world would I ever want to make these? The reason is because they are much better leaving groups than an OH. Thus, in a two-step sequence, I can take an ROH and convert it into one of these, which are called sulfonate esters, and take the sulfonate esters and treat it with any nucleophile and get an SN2 reaction where the nucleophile has replaced the sulfonate ester group. In a separate reaction, I can take an alcohol such as this one, treat it with acid, water, or POCL3, and do an elimination reaction, which for this specific type of substance, an alcohol, is called a dehydration, giving me an alkene product. Separately, I can take a primary alcohol, treat it with PCC or periodinate, and oxidize it up only one bond to oxygen, giving me an aldehyde. Or if I treat the same molecule with any of these stronger chromate oxidizing agents, I can get a carboxylic acid. If I take a secondary alcohol and treat it with any of the above oxidizing reagents, it can only oxidize up one total bond to oxygen, giving me a ketone. And if I try to do the same reaction with a tertiary alcohol, I get no reaction at all, because in a tertiary alcohol, the central carbon is not bonded to any hydrogens. Separately, if I take this type of molecule called a halohydrin, in which I have an OH on one carbon and a chlorine or bromine on the adjacent carbon, I can hit that with base, the base strips the proton, gives me an O-, and the O- cyclizes down here, kicks off the halide to give me this molecule, an epoxide. Separately, of course, I can take an alkene, as we've learned in an earlier chapter, and treat it with a peroxy acid to also form the same product. Epoxides are useful because I can treat them under acidic conditions in the presence of a nucleophile to place the nucleophile on the internal carbon, or I can treat them under basic conditions in which I've got a negatively charged nucleophile and have the nucleophile be placed on the external carbon. Separately, if I treat an amine shown here with an alkyl halide, I can get this nitrogen to alkylate one or more times to give me this type of product called an ammonium salt. If I take an ammonium salt that has a hydrogen that's on the carbon adjacent to one of the carbons bonded to my nitrogen and treat it with hydroxide and heat, I can do an elimination giving me the anti or non zeitsev's product, alkene. In a separate reaction, I can treat a thiol with an alkyl halide to generate a sulfide. And that summarizes all of our reactions from chapter 10. I want to finish by showing you some synthesis problems. For students who are taking this from me, we will work m as many of these out as you'd like to together in class. I, of course, encourage you to attempt them all on your own before coming to class. Here is the question. Show how the starting materials below could each be converted to the indicated products. 
Here's one, a primary alcohol being converted to this molecule called an ester. Separately, I've got an alkene being converted to this carboxylic acid. Additionally, I've got this primary alcohol being converted to this sulfide. And here I've got this primary bromide being converted to this carboxylic acid. And lastly, I've got this molecule, which is a cyclic amine, being converted into this unusual diene. So that ends our coverage of chapter 10. It's been wonderful time talking to you today. Please study hard and learn these reactions. Feel free to take notes, make a list of the reactants, products, and reagents that are used in this chapter, and study them hard so that you know what each of these conditions will do to the given starting materials. Good luck with all that, and until next time, have an enjoyable rest of your day.